So while we're uh, while we're waiting for people to filter upstairs, on a scale of beginner, intermediate, advanced, how many people here are beginners in Drupal theming and design? Awesome. Wow. Intermediate. Advanced. Okay, that's actually a really good uh, cross section. That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, and given uh, the choices, designer, themer, or developer, how many people here, and you can be more than one, how many people here are designers? Okay, themers. All right, developers. Cool. All right, developers, this actually is going to be pretty relevant to you because it's going to give you some insight into, into what we do. Um, quick poll, this is sort of unrelated to what we're doing here, but I, I just like to ask people this from time to time. How many people here uh, hear the word themer and, and immediately understand what that means and what that involves? Okay, how many don't? How many don't have a clue what a themer is and what that's supposed to mean? Okay, cool. I think that that is, and Adam is, is one of them. I'm going to raise my hand. Um, this is just sort of an aside. It seems that the role of themer is kind of unique to Drupal in that it requires a, a cross-section of skills. And that cross-section is something that we're going to be touching on. Uh, just a little bit. So we've waited a couple minutes. We should get started. Uh, welcome to Don't Design Websites, Design Web Systems. Uh, very quickly, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Todd Neenkirk. I am a co-founder, designer, and developer at Four Kitchens. We're a, a small uh, Drupal and, and open source consulting shop in Austin, Texas, but we make big websites. I'm really into Drupal. I love Drupal. Um, I love coming to events like this. I'm primarily a designer. I'm also a developer. And in a previous life, I was a writer and editor. My name is Adam Snetman. Can everyone hear me OK, by the way? I'm using this lapel thing. And it's uh, not probably it's as loud as the, the hand mic. But um, Hopefully, if somebody's listening, they can raise the lapel mic. OK, but. good. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, I'm a design director at a, a branding and design agency in New York City called Think So Creative. And uh, if Todd will advance my little icons, uh, I'm, I'm very into design. I've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, uh, user experience is something I'm really passionate about. Uh, content strategy also, and information architecture. And uh, I'm an unrepentant cat person. So I hope that's OK <laughs> with everyone in this room. So the, the designer and the developer, or the, the themer and the developer, are the Batman and Robin of, of building websites. Um, this was actually not chosen because of tonight's event, but rather in general. Uh, Depending on wh who you are and where you're coming from, you might pick yourself to be Batman or yourself to be, I don't know who would pick Robin. But the other person is usually sort of seen as the Robin, right? So together we form some kind of a dynamic duo. Uh, and in this case, we're going to be talking about designers and themers slash developers. And Adam, in this case, is the designer. And I'm going to be the Drupal themer slash developer in this presentation. So what do we mean by websites versus web systems? So in the old days, who remembers the old days of the internet? Websites were measured in pages. Who remembers this? My website is five pages. How much will it cost for you to make an eight page website? <laughs> uh, and this was because each of these pages were single files. They were HTML files that had to be uh, maintained by hand. So it made sense to split it up into pages because that was the scope of work. You knew how long it would take you to make one page as opposed to 10. Uh, but today's websites are dynamic, uh, meaning that they're always changing. The content in them changes not necessarily along with the files that run the website. Uh, today's websites allow maintainers to create and edit content directly through the website. So you click edit on a node, you're on the website, changing the website itself, and they generate their own output. And that's because today's websites are actually web systems. Today's websites are software. And that's a big distinction. So things have changed quite a bit in only a few years. The big point we want to make today is that designers are incredibly powerful. And a lot of us don't know it. But with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Uh, designers, designers determine a site's functionality not developers. And we communicate this functionality to the developers who implement our designs through various tools and, and products of our trade, through sitemaps, wireframes, site comps, uh, or design comps, things like process flow diagrams, all kinds of things that we give them that explain what's in our head. 
So let's consider the login link, right? The humble login link on a design comp. It's six characters, two words, but it tells an incredible story because in order to log in, users have to be able to create accounts, they have to reset passwords, they have to update account information, and then there's all kinds of other stuff like permissions. Now that you have users, some users should do things that others shouldn't. Uh, there's privacy issues. Some information should be publicly visible, some should not. You also have to deal with an email system. If you're doing uh, password resets, you have to have an email system that interacts with that user so that they can reclaim that password. Now you have to worry about having your website on a server that can properly send email. And what happens if that server address is blacklisted and it's going into spam filters and things like that? These are, are serious issues that we have to contend with, all because we put those two words on a design comp, login, right? We forget how much power we are placing in a design by doing something so small. So we, designers, are a site's primary architects. Thank you, Todd. Thank um, you, Adam. So we're going to talk about what, what, this, can I take your hand yeah, thing? Yeah, I'm going to ditch this before I mess it up. All right, I'll stand over here too. So we're going to talk about what we mean and what the different steps that we take when designing a web system and thinking systematically, thinking about websites in that way. And uh, the first step is to stop and close Photoshop. Right? It's not time to push pixels around. You wouldn't uh, paint a house before you build it, and so there's no way that you would ever try to design a site without doing all this preliminary architecture and thinking before you're even ready to start deciding what color anything is. Um, how's that? Is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, step one would be define the site. Right? And this step is, is divided up into a lot of pieces and a lot of key questions that you need to answer at this phase of the game. Uh, here's four of them. What's the purpose of the site? Right? That's something that everyone needs to know before they set out to build a website. What is it going to do? Uh, we want to know who the audience is and who the site is for. That's going to influence a lot of the decisions we make down the road. Uh, we want to know what the content is going to be and how we're going to organize that content. And we want to know how uh, people are going to experience the site and interact with it. Right? This is everything that has to happen before we actually design anything. Uh, so to talk about the purpose of the site, the, what you're trying to do to answer this question is to start gathering goals and requirements. And the way we do that is typically in uh, kickoff meetings with the client or doing interviews with key stakeholders to try to sort of gather all the important people in the room and make a list of, of their business goals, for example, which might be things like uh, generating buzz for a new product, uh, it might be to raise awareness for an existing product. It might be building a community around a topic or an initiative. It might be to make some money. Uh, it might also be making more money than the money they're already making. And you might want to throw in a few little other bits of money that seems to be uh, on a lot of people's mind, how to make money online. Uh, but once we have sort of those goals, we can start to think about what the requirements and constraints are going to be uh, so that when we go into later phases of the design process, we know what we're dealing with. Things like brand guidelines. Are you working for an established company that has a set of guidelines in place that dictate typeface, color, logo, uh, grid system, things like that? Uh, there might also be SEO requirements that you're going to need to think about. Uh, what, what sort of strategy might they have in place for that sort of thing? Uh, there's also accessibility issues. Are you working on a government site that needs to be accessible in uh, way stricter ways than uh, a new product launch site might be. Uh, what's your strategy for mobile devices? Are you going to uh, build a responsive site that adapts to whatever environment it's in? Or are you going to do the sort of split way of doing things where there might be one mobile site and one desktop site? Uh, there's also infrastructure issues, any, any kind of server or hosting or technology platform issues that might influence uh, design decisions that you make down the road. And there's also things like performance and browser compatibility. We all deal with browser compatibility. It's sort of the, the ugly stepchild that rears its head on every site that we end up making. Uh, it's definitely something to think about. So once we've uh, gathered all those things, we've made our big list, we've talked to stakeholders, we can, sort, we can decide who the audience is for our site. And this is a really important step that, um, that can, can get left out and can get left by the wayside. And the way we do that is to create personas. Uh, have everyone, has anyone in this room worked with personas before? 
All right, good. That's a lot of hands. So what is a persona? Um, this is what you do when you make a persona. The first step for us is to make a list of the target audiences and describe who we think our visitors are going to be. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to create one persona for each of those target audiences. And you want to give that persona at least a name, an age, a face, a reason for visiting, and a wish list of tasks they're going to do on the website. So here's an example. All right, here's a persona. Uh, this is a random person. I don't know who this person is, but um, I've created this, this persona. The audience type that I'm considering here is New York City-based graphic designers. I know that they are going to be ones that want to visit this site. I know that this person is 34 years old. Uh, I've given them a face. I know that they're coming to the site that I'm working on called SweetPlaidShirts.com because this guy has 80% of his wardrobe comprised of these shirts. Uh, he buys them regularly. He was recommended uh, to shop at this site by a good friend. And his wish list when he gets to the site, what are the things he's going to be doing? He wants to be able to sort available shirts by criteria, like most popular, newly added. He wants to see what shirts his friends have purchased. You don't want to make that faux pas of buying the same shirt that your friend has and wearing it to the same event. That's really embarrassing. And uh, he might want to sign up for an account to save preferences. Uh, so now that I've made this persona, uh, what this lets me do is as I continue the steps in the design process, at every step of the game, I can make sure, refer back to my personas I've created and see, am I satisfying the needs and reasons for uh, all of my target audiences? And it becomes much easier to do that, especially when you're talking directly with clients, if you can talk about... Adam, who's 34, who, who loves plaid shirts, instead of the generic target audience of New York City-based graphic designers, right? It makes, it makes this nebulous concept of the target audience into something concrete that's easy to discuss and easy to keep in mind. Oh, sorry, we skipped one there. Hold on a second. All right, we're in step three, right? What's the, what's the content and how is it going to be organized? And the way we do that is we define our content types and create a sitemap. So in Drupal, uh, along with any other content management system, uh, different types of content are content types. And uh, these things are defined by the different pieces of information that they contain. Uh, here's an example. If we are doing a site with a blog as a component, we know that the blog post is a content type. And because it's a blog post, I know it's going to have these sorts of elements. It's going to have a title, author, date published, etc. Uh, if we were talking about a product site, like in our shirts example, uh, a shirt is going to have a name, a description, a price. Uh, these are two examples of products. I can go ahead and list the, the different uh, information elements that make up that product type and once I've done this I have a really good idea of the the basic building blocks the content building blocks that my site is going to be dealing with and then we can take that information and start to make a sitemap with it so sitemap should do these basic things it should list sorry it should list all the sections and pages of a site and it should illustrate how those sections are organized uh, sitemaps are pretty basic I'm sure everyone in this room has dealt with and created sitemaps in the past. Here's an example of one. Uh, the important thing that to note is that everything that's an actual page that can be reached with the URL needs to be represented in some way on a sitemap. Uh, sometimes we take shortcuts for things, content that is very similar, like a blog post, for example, we would represent as a stack of pages instead of a discrete box. And that, that is a shorthand way of saying these are all the same type of thing. There's a lot of them but I'm, I'm indicating on my sitemap where that page is in the overall hierarchy of the site. Um, once we got the content under our belts, we can sort of create our uh, wireframes. And what do wireframes do for us? So they're supposed to, they do a lot of things actually. They illustrate navigation and layout. That's the time to do that. They're going to demonstrate functionality and show how elements of our user interfaces are going to work. They identify static versus dynamically generated elements that are on each page. And they can help us identify all the unique layouts we're going to have to consider when we actually get to visual design. Uh, here's an example of a sitemap. 
very simple site with a lot of dummy content in it. But you can see how we're starting to frame out and, and answer all of those uh, bullet points on the previous slide. So we're indicating some main nav here in this wireframe. Uh, we're also hinting at some of the UI we're going to use. I can see here that I'm going to have uh, some sort of search interface there, and I'm also going to have a tabbed interface to kind of view the same type of content according to different criteria. Uh, I have an example here of dynamic and uh, curated content, so I, I can, I'm pretty sure from that list over there that those articles are going to be dynamically fed in. That's not something any editor is going to have to be responsible for maintaining. And I can see in the center here that this is something that an editor would be responsible for for maintaining. It's hero articles, featured articles. I can also see from my wireframes the different layouts I'm going to have to contend with. Uh, any site you do will probably at least have these two things. There'd be a home page layout and an interior page layout. Of course, most of the sites we build, being as complex as they are, uh, have many more layout templates than this. But the wireframes let us uh, put all these these different templates next to each other and get a sense of how how large a set of things am I going to have to be designing once I get to the visual design phase. Uh, as far as tools for creating wireframes, we're going to we're going to insert a few tips here and there. This is something that uh, Todd introduced me to and I have grown to really love. It's called Balsamic Mockups. Has anyone used Balsamic Mockups to make wireframes? Okay, awesome. We won't spend too much time explaining it, but for those who don't know what it does, it's, uh, you can use it in a desktop uh, version, and it also has a web-based version that I have not used, but that s fosters kind of collaboration between teams and, and let teams easily work on the same, uh, the same set of wireframes. But it's cross-platform, it's got a lot of plugins, they even have a free license for do-gooders, uh, which is great, and um, there are Drupal components that that, what do those do, Todd? Can you explain that better, how the Drupal components work? Okay, they're pre-built UI components that sort of plug di directly into Drupal and are made to work very well with it. Uh, and time and budget permitting, this is sort of an extra step that we love to do with our clients, but not every client we work with has the time or the budget to do it. We do some usability testing. And the, the purpose of the usability testing is to validate all the assumptions that you've made up to this step. You know, you're, you're doing sitemaps, you're doing wireframes, you're making a lot of assumptions about how the target audiences you're trying to reach are going to think about your site and interact with it. And uh, it's great to make sure you are right about those assumptions. And the way you do that is with testing. And uh, usability testing sounds kind of big and scary and expensive, but it doesn't have to be, right? There, there's a continuum of usability testing, and it can be everything from a, a very quick sketch drawn on a napkin and shown to someone. It can go uh, as far as paper prototypes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you can also develop keynote prototypes, which are basically using keynote to simulate the interactions of a, a piece of functionality or your interface or uh, the navigation of an entire site. And you can go as far as doing real live HTML and CSS prototypes for what you're doing. And uh, now we're up to you. Thank you. This thing is very sensitive. Choose your platform. Okay, so now we've done all of this architecture stuff, right? Notice at no point so far have we said Drupal or Joomla or Expression Engine or anything like that because we want these initial phases, the initial phases, to be more independent of a content management system. So at this point, knowing all the things that you need to do and all of the kind of navigation and UI that you need to perform and the goals of the site, that's when you can make an informed decision about the platform that you're going to use. Uh, Drupal isn't always the best solution, so before you get angry, I want to explain that if you're doing something like building a simple blog and it's just going to do typical blog stuff and nothing more and it won't have users, WordPress is probably better for something like this. If you're doing, um, I won't get into others, there are other content management systems out there, but be careful about what you choose because Drupal is great, it's really powerful, but as we all know, it can be very complicated. So we want to make sure that we're making the best decision platform-wise for the project based on the goals that the client has outlined. 
Once you've chosen this platform, you need to translate everything into Drupal speak or, you know, insert content management system here speak. Uh, every content management system has its own jargon and its own way of doing things. So we need to start translating all of these goals, UI elements, navigation components into things that uh, speak to Drupal. Very quickly, uh, this is very basic stuff for everybody here, but as a reminder, most Drupal sites are comprised of just a small handful of things. So there's this notion of content, right? That's easy, but it's not always a node. We need to think of content as views, panels, user profiles, forms, admin interfaces, contexts. Anything that appears on the page is essentially content. There are also blocks, menus, primary and secondary links, stuff like that. Typical theme elements, typical UI elements in Drupal. That's part of your Drupal speak vocabulary and you need to start translating wireframes into, uh, into these terms and these concepts. So now, now we've done all of this other stuff, it's time to do the visual design. So go ahead and open Photoshop. Now you can make an informed decision about how to create a compelling and effective design. You couldn't really do this before because you didn't know the goals, you didn't know how the users would interact with the site, you didn't know who was using the site, you didn't know what platform you were using. If you started doing design before this point, you're just going to have to redo it all. Some things to consider when you're building the visual design. You need to consider how type, color, imagery will translate a client's brand to the web. In many cases, clients don't really feel comfortable on the web or they've, most of their materials are physical. So they, they understand the physical world or they understand print, but they don't really understand the unique complexities of the web. And it's up to you as the designer to help them translate that. Uh, one of the things that we do that's really helpful is we want to generate this kind of discussion. We want to generate um, a little bit of brainstorming with a client using some tools such as mood boards and style tiles. And very quickly, and this could be a presentation unto itself, and I highly recommend that you look up uh, Samantha Warren. Uh, I, I'll have a little link later on. She's with Phase 2. Um, she does a lot of stuff with style tiles, and they're really neat, and I'll explain what those are in just a moment. Uh, using mood boards and style tiles are faster and much cheaper than doing a bunch of iterations of comps. So if you do a comp, you have to do you know two or three different page layouts, and you have to fix all these little things, and there are all these little details. Uh, and then you show them to the client and they come back with 20 changes and you have to redo it and you kind of cycle back and forth with these large bulky documents. But mood boards and style tiles give you some insight into what, they're, what they want to do before you actually start building it. Uh, it's going to involve the client in the design process so they feel more attached to it. It's not like you're some distant designer who occasionally drops in and gives them ideas and they kind of like it or they don't or you know they don't really understand what's going on. It involves them. Uh, it's going to increase their confidence and the, uh, the chance that they're going to buy into what you're doing. And they're also really fun to make. So here's an example of a mood board. The idea is really just a collage. You want to create a collage of color, type, imagery, ideas, feelings. Uh, here's another. These two evoke very different moods, right? This feels a little edgy, new. You know, here we have MTV, Wired, Jon Stewart. And here we have baby, you know, this, to me, this seems like this would be a baby boy, right? Browns and blues and things like that. And there's a little robot. I mean, th it just sort of, it, I tend to feel that way. And of course it says boy right there. Um, now a style tile is a little bit different because it's not a collage. It's a sampling of graphical elements and a color palette and type. And the idea is still to evoke a mood, but now you're moving more towards a website. This, this looks much more like a website than this, right? This doesn't look like a website. This looks like somebody's having fun pasting a bunch of things to a piece of paper, which is exactly what we did to get here. But now we want to take those elements and start to move in the direction of the website. And these style tiles, which Samantha Warren at Phase 2 uses quite a bit, are really interesting. Here's an example of three of her style tiles for one project. Each of these three look very different, right? But these three are given to a client, and she asks the client, tell me what about each of these speaks to you and your brand and your goals, and what does not? And then they iterate through these small things. These are single pages. They iterate through these smaller things and eventually arrive at a proper visual design. So it's more faster, it's more agile, and you get the big stuff out of the way, type, colors, without having to build a full comp. Here are three links that are very useful. Uh, they all begin with bit.ly and they end with collab with clients, mood boards, style tiles. 
And this presentation will be available to download on the London site later. So if you don't want to write all this stuff down right now, you can uh, wait just a little bit longer. And Adam. Okay, so we we've, we've spent a lot of time in theoretical world, and we're going to now move into the real world. And uh, we put together this case study for uh, a client of ThinkSo's and Four Kitchens called Expeditionary Learning. And we're going to sort of show you how this whole process played out for this one particular uh, project. Uh, so who, who are these people? It's going to help you to know who they are as we go through. Expeditionary Learning, uh, they're an education reform organization in the US and they partner with schools and districts and school boards to reform the curriculum of schools and retrain teachers and uh, basically from top to bottom they they orchestrate the entire learning experience so if you have a school that's not working how it should or it's a brand new school that's being founded you can bring in expeditionary learning and they will reform the entire process of learning at that school uh, and EL, who I'll call them from now on to save myself from saying expeditionary learning, uh, they partnered with ThinkSo and uh, brought in Four Kitchens later to relaunch their brand and redo their website. So for some background, this is the previous logo for expeditionary learning. Uh, the name was really long. It's those five words. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen the name of an organization take up this much space. Uh, they were an offshoot of a U.S.-based uh, organization called Outward Bound, which is all about uh, developing leadership in children by taking them on camping trips and basically doing things outdoors. Um, so the expeditionary learning at first had this reference to the compass rose, which is an important symbol for Outward Bound uh, in their original logo. Um, but a, a lot of sort of problems for them with this logo, not just the length of the name, but uh, it, it was very hard to reproduce on a lot of printed materials because the logo has a lot of fiddly and tiny details. Um, but this is where they started. And this was the website that they started with. Uh, it's, not, it's not the most terrible starting website I've ever seen, but it's, it's clearly uh, from the 90s. Um, the nav is, is not, too, it's not too long. The architecture seems to sort of make sense at first glance. It's, uh, it's clean, I guess you could say, but it definitely doesn't project the sort of professional and practiced and established uh, image that expeditionary learning wanted to uh, convey to the outside world. Uh, so here's the results of the rebrand we did for them. This is the new logo we developed. Uh, it's, it, the key symbol in this logo is this uh, chevron-shaped uh, crimson signpost, we ended up calling it. And th this signpost symbol was uh, a forward-looking arrow. It, it has all those connotations of building for the future and training the next generation uh, of students kind of baked into it. It's, it's also supposed to be reminiscent and allude back to the Outward Bound legacy or the roots uh, that EL uh, has as a part of their DNA because it, it kind of would resemble m perhaps a sign you might see on a hiking trail at a trailhead that's pointing you in the right direction you want to go. Uh, we also baked in some tiny details to the E. You can see the, the, the inside of the E and the point of the E is kind of referencing a half compass in there. I, it's not something that anyone who sees this at first glance ever notices, but um, EL had a, a few hang-ups about distancing themselves too much from their heritage and that was a nice way that we could bake that in without having it be uh, too kind of hit you over the head with where they came from. And the, the typeface we chose is a lot more modern and progressive. It's DIN condensed uh, and we used it um, in all caps for the name and it was set just like that. Uh, I just want to show you a couple applications to, to kind of give you a sense of how the design system evolved. Here's their business cards and uh, these are sitting on top of a folder. So we, we took that symbol and blew it up and used it big where it made sense. It's kind of varnished and some clear varnish on the top of this folder. And uh, the symbol kind of got to stand on its own and uh, be celebrated, kind of decoupled from the name on the business cards. And it also kind of handily points the way to the relevant contact information, which was a good thing. And we also got to make flags. If anyone's ever made a flag, or hasn't made a flag, uh, it's awesome. 
It's awesome to make a logo that's eight feet wide and flies up in the air with wind rippling and dramatic music. Uh, and it sort of translated very nicely into a flag design. And, and we showed this to them and they immediately glommed onto the idea that they could fly this flag uh, on the staff of the schools that are part of the EL network and the EL organization. Uh, we did a launch brochure, so when the brand first launched, we wanted to create a piece that really celebrated it and introduced the new brand to all of the teachers, principals, uh, school uh, designers. It's a, their term for the, the people who actually go train the new teachers. Uh, everyone in their network, basically, that would, would be part of the, this new EL that we were developing, get them excited about it. Uh, show them what the new messages we were creating, uh, the new, I guess, the new DNA that would make up the EL brand. We made this launch piece that was, uh, it was like tabloid newspaper size, and it went out to everyone in the EL network. And we also created some field journals, and these got passed out to the students in EL schools. Uh, the thing that is really unique about their approach to learning is, uh, the example I use is, is in my public school, growing up, we would learn our sort of bird anatomy from the biology textbook. But if you're a student in an EL school, what you do is you go outside of the classroom and you do your own survey of all the birds in your immediate area. You take that data back. Uh, you meet with ornithologists or people at the local museum to kind of pro help you process your data. And you pack that all together and eventually present a field guide of the birds of your immediate neighborhood, complete with drawings and paintings. Um, it sounds really awesome. It made me want to go back to school every time that w we talked to them about what the student experience was like. And we made these field journals for the students because it, it spoke directly to that attitude of let's get out of the classroom and go experience things and, and learn in context instead of just uh, reading from books. Uh, but then we had to address this website. And what were we going to do? And how did that work out. So we have our, our handy scale of theory versus practice. Here's the theory side. This is the steps we've talked about. It all made sense. It seemed to proceed logically from uh, beginning to end. Everything was built on the thing before. Uh, but unfortunately for this project, what happened was we're starting at OK. We're defining the site. Uh, but then we're doing visual design. We had to do we had to sell the brand and develop directions, visual design directions, to get EL to choose which way they were going to go. We ended up doing, I think, three different directions before they settled on one. And part of that was doing a lot of visual design up front to show how the different options we were showing them would eventually be applied. For the website specifically, we didn't yet have a development partner at the table or a, con or a CMS in mind. So we started on visual design first, which is definitely um, made it harder down the road, as you'll see. Uh, then we chose our platform. Then we translated into Drupal Speak with the help of Four Kitchens and Todd and his team. And then we went back and revisited some of the decisions we made in the site definition process and some of the decisions we made in the visual design, because we ended up, uh, because we didn't have Drupal in mind and uh, we didn't sort of do things in the right order, we ended up designing things that were either uh, not possible to do in Drupal or really expensive and uh, would not have been the best use of EL's budget to actually execute. So I'm going to take you through uh, step one. We define the EL site and, and we talked about goals and requirements. These are the basic goals for the site we were setting out to do. It's mainly to communicate EL's mission, vision, and methods. Uh, we wanted to, of course, translate this new brand identity that everyone was excited about to the web and do it justice. And uh, we had another mandate to create and design secure online tools for all of EL's teachers that would help them collaborate with each other and plan their lessons and, and basically implement the unique approach to learning that this organization takes. Uh, we then decided on the audience. So uh, these are just some of the personas we developed. I think we ended up with seven. Uh, the important thing to notice here is that we tried to represent all of EL's audiences in these personas. Uh, and that meant using people of all different ages, genders, races, backgrounds. We had a mix of students, uh, teachers, principals, policy makers, public figures. Uh, we ended up with sort of a, a very nice representative set of personas that helped guide us through the rest of the project. Now we then moved to content. 
uh, because we didn't have a partner at the table yet. We, we kind of skipped the content type step, which is something that would, be, have would have been nice to have done at this point, but we went right to sitemap. And here's the sitemap we created. And as you can see, it was very uh, large and complicated. Um, as far as how it tracks to the goals we mentioned previously, sort of all of this stuff over here was all about communicating the mission to EL's core audiences. And over there was the secure online tools. Um, uh, another kind of pitfall of this process was that what looks like a very simple column of information, that looks simple, secure online tools. There's six things. How hard could that be to execute and build? Well, it turns out if we had fast forwarded, we would see that just one of these tools, which we'd called the planner, is actually more accurately represented by these, uh, these 15 boxes uh, interconnected boxes over here. And that's just, um, we just didn't know at first what we were going to be getting ourselves into. And so it would have also helped to have been able to see that uh, before we proceeded. Uh, so how are people going to experience the site? We wanted to do wireframes, of course. And we this is a look at what our wireframes look like. These are, uh, we're mostly concerned with content, but I can see that I'm doing those things that I need to do uh, and defining those elements I need to define. I have my main nav sort of uh, demonstrated here. I have some section nav over here. I have second secondary nav up top. There's not much user interface going on on this particular page. I know I have a search bar up in the secondary nav, but aside from that, uh, this example doesn't really have much user interface uh, elements determined. I can also see from here that uh, I am developing a hierarchy of information on my page. So I have my page title and intro. I can assume that uh, on pages of this site, there's going to be some sort of large big picture introductory message when I get to a page of content. I have my main content underneath, and I'm going to have some sidebar or ancillary information uh, over to the right. So that those wireframes were for the mission and vision part of the site. We ended up in this process actually working on the online tools and the mission and vision stuff separately. Uh, and so we did a, another wireframe process that was only dedicated to the interactive tools we wanted to develop. And uh, this is literally how those tools started. Uh, before we came to EL, these were the tools that their teachers were using to plan lessons. Right? They were actually pieces of paper they would print out and they would fill in all the boxes. Um, all the red scribbles were my notes from uh, hours of conversations with people inside EL that, that basically had to explain to me how they use these, what their terminology was, uh, how they fit within their usual process. And this is what they look like. And they're, the way EL structures its um, learning is that you have what's called a learning expedition. That's the big long-term thing students working on. You have a project. Uh, a learning expedition might be made up of three different projects, and then you have an individual lesson that tells a teacher what they're doing on a particular day. And so these things have a hierarchical relationship to each other. Uh, here's a look at what the wireframes look like for these tools. They're, they're a little bit more detailed, as you can see from the others. From a user interface perspective, um, we ended up creating a whole deck of these uh, that basically represented every screen and every interface you would see while you were using these uh, project planning tools. Uh, and the reason we did that uh, is so that w when we eventually had our development partner, we would have a, a serious handbook that we could sit down with them and say, this is exactly what we need to build, and we need your help to build it. So it, was, it ended up being really useful for Four Kitchens to have this kind of Bible that they could refer to um, when it was time to think about how they were going to approach the project and actually to guide them through the actual build phase. Uh, we also made some process flow diagrams. Um, Todd alluded to these earlier, but we didn't really touch on them in any detail. Uh, we just created some diagrams that gave a little bit more background on some of the aspects of the wireframes that might not be totally apparent on first glance. So we wanted to, for example, uh, illustrate how when a teacher goes into the tool to create a new learning expedition, these are the steps they would follow uh, just to help the developer and EL understand uh, the workflow from logging in to, yes, I've created a new expedition. Uh, we then were fortunate enough to get to do some usability testing 
and for this client, we ended up right there on the continuum, paper prototypes. Uh, we, we had this handy deck of wireframes we created, and we just printed those out on large sheets of paper and went to their national conference and sat in a room with uh, EL teachers between sessions and gave them a list of tasks to do. You know, create a learning expedition, uh, link this project with this er expedition you already created, uh, email a link to this project you made to, to someone else in the network. Uh, and we observed what they did and uh, we would act as kind of the human computer, basically putting down the new sheet of paper that corresponded to the screen they would see. And they would use their finger as the mouse pointer and sort of talk, talk us through their thought process out loud. Uh, and it ended up being really valuable to do. We sort of uh, were validated and uh, got to see that a lot of the decisions we had made were actually corresponding to the teacher's mental model of what the experience should be uh, and the feedback from those sessions was really, really positive. Um, there were also a few pitfalls that we didn't notice or assumptions we had made that they brought up that were really great to know uh, about. And um, that's something that seems to always happen with usability testing. Something you, you think is really obvious because you're so close to the project and every aspect of it ends up not being obvious for a, a real person that's using your stuff. So um, fortunately, we were able to correct those mistakes early on. So we, we define the site, we have our complete definition, now we can actually do visual design. Uh, this, is, this became step two in our kind of not so smooth process. But uh, this is what the site looks like. And um, you can see our kind of branding goals, how these are tracking to this visual design. We have our logo nicely and prominently positioned at the top left. Uh, we have our typography figuring prominently in the main navigation. Uh, we ended up using the signpost, the little pointer, as a prominent element on a lot of design uh, like you saw before. But on the website in specific, uh, we used it to contain the tagline that we developed for expeditionary learning. Uh, we get a sense of the imagery here. We, we knew we wanted images that would communicate the emotional experience of students at EL schools. We thought those would be uh, the best way to sell what EL is all about. Let's show the kids in their environment uh, learning and shows sort of the joy and the, the actual pride in what you're doing that comes from being in an EL school. And uh, this page also gives you a sense of how we're applying uh, color throughout the brand. Crimson is a very signature color that came through um, actually because EL was originally conceived at the Harvard School of Education. So we wanted to sort of make another nod to that part of their legacy in this heavy use of crimson, which is one of Harvard University's signature colors. Uh, we also developed a grid. So we knew uh, in a design this complicated and robust with the many, many layouts we're going to have to execute, we want a nice strong grid in place. And that's what that grid looked like. Um, something that I, I did for this project that I don't always do is uh, create a baseline grid also and try to have every, every element, every image, every piece of typography, every bit of white space kind of conform to uh, lines of this baseline grid to really set up a nice strong rhythm as you move down the page. Uh, it's something that is not easy to do online and it's, it's not something I always um, end up thinking is useful or the better said you, you might spend time better this time better spent on other aspects of the design than implementing a strict baseline grid because the web as we know is not print so uh, some of these things don't always translate in the web world. I'm not totally 100% convinced that um, it's necessary. But for this site, we did it. It ended up being good, uh, though it, it, was, it was hard to do. And I wouldn't necessarily do it for every site that um, we work on. Uh, here's a look at the different layouts we ended up creating. So we have our home page here on the left. We have a landing page layout on the right, and uh, sorry, in the middle. And we have an interior page uh, layout uh, on the right. And you can see sort of what we're starting to do with the signpost in particular is uh, it it stays on the page as we move to different levels of the site, but it's it's performing almost a wayfinding function for you. So on the home page, it's very large. On the landing page, it's a little bit smaller, but still containing the title of the page that you're on. And then when you get to an interior page, it's actually used as the highlighting element in the sub-navigation on the left. So it's this reinforced 
signal along with the red uh, of this is exactly where I am in this site that's comprised of a, a whole bunch of content. Uh, we also do kind of a step down thing with the imagery to sort of indicate that you're getting deeper and into more detail oriented areas. So I have big image on the home page. I still have an image on primary landing pages, but once I get inside the site, that image goes away and we just have the title. So sort of at first glance, these pages look like the level that you're on in your sort of web uh, reading navigation experience. This is just a closer look at how that landing page works and looks like. Uh, here's more of the imagery I was talking about. We try to emph uh, emphasize college readiness. That's one of EL's real themes. They, they want to show that their way of learning, which is kind of unorthodox, actually prepares students for college just as well as, as any other approach would, or, and even better in many cases. And so we wanted to sort of incorporate that idea into the imagery we were using. Uh, I can see here, if I check back to my wireframe I created, that I'm tracking pretty well to all the elements I've already laid out. So uh, because we did a kind of detailed and good job with these wireframes, making sure that all of our um, T's were crossed and our I's were dotted, that I know when I get to visual design, this is exactly what I have to account for. And, uh, and so I can just see that, yes, I'm doing that. Uh, in addition to those three main layouts, we had other kind of unique unique interface elements or types of pages that needed some additional design work. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't have just handed off those three comps to a developer and say, go build stuff, because we had things like a blog with extra categories and the, the different pieces of information that a blog post needs that a regular page doesn't need that we have to account for. What do comments look like? Uh, where are categories housed? Is it in a footer? Is it off to the side? Uh, how does that navigation that uh, the blog would use that other pages wouldn't use appear on the blog pages. Uh, we also had a image gallery. So um, this part of the site was a showcase for the student projects that EL students have done. Uh, they, they really felt that that part of their curriculum really shows off their approach. So we created a special section of the site to showcase that work. And this is what the galleries look like. And there were other elements and graphics on the page, like this uh, data-driven stuff, charts and graphs, that kind of reinforce that, yes, our approach works, that we had to decide what do these things look like. Uh, and uh, we had those online tools we talked about. Those, those needed all their own uh, interface work, in addition to all the stuff we already showed. And um, this is what one of the landing pages of one of those tools looked like, it, with easy ways to browse and search. Uh, a library of documents. And you could, of course, click in and see uh, information about particular documents and share them and rate them, uh, etc. And at this point, we ended up choosing Drupal for EL. We weren't totally sure that that was how it was going to work out, but after initial conversations with uh, those trusted people that you call up and say, hey, I have this site I'm working on. This is what it's about. Uh, who do you think I should go to for this? Uh, it ended up more people than not said this is a perfect Drupal project, and that's how we ended up choosing Drupal and eventually finding Todd at Four Kitchens. So, as you can tell, um, think so. Adam and think so did a tremendous amount of work before it was handed off to somebody who now has to implement all of this stuff that you've seen. Uh, it was uh, it was great for us because it gave us a lot of materials to work with. We had very few questions for them because they had already asked all the questions of the client. We saw all these uh, decks of wireframes and visual designs and process flow diagrams and all of this reasoning and all of this thought and we knew that we were in good hands. So everything was well explained and well defined. So what was left for us to do besides building the site was translating everything that they had just done into Drupal speak. So now we're gonna have to think about everything that they've done in terms of Drupal. Ideally we would have done this throughout the process, but uh, we had to take a step back and look at the wireframe. So we saw these things across the top and we asked them, hey, what's what's going on here? And ThinkSo came back and said, well, those are the sections of the site. Okay, sections. So I hear sections, right? I run that through my little Drupal filter and I know that it's probably going to have a primary menu item. That'll probably be the primary menu item somewhere. Uh, and that we may use say the context module to define the, a context that is the section. So when we're in a section of the site, a certain context is active. Uh, context is a, is a module for Drupal, by the way, if, if you're not aware. 
Uh, so we took another look at the site map and we said, what are these things down here below the, uh, the section titles? Um, and think so and EL came back and said, well, those are the section landing pages. So each section has a landing page of some sort without exception. So we heard section landing pages and we run that through our little Drupal speak filter and we think, well, maybe it's panels, maybe it's a view, uh, but we do know that it's going to have a secondary menu that is specific to that section. So when you land on a secondary, when, when you land on a section and you're on a section landing page, there's going to be a unique menu to navigate just that part of the site. And here's an example of one of those landing pages. So looking up here, um, you know, we're, we're looking for Drupal components of this part. How do we, how do we translate this visual design into Drupal speak? We see the logo, right? Everybody knows the, the logo variable, uh, breadcrumb. They had put that in the design. There's the search box. So we're going to be using the search module or Apache solar or something like that. Uh, we take a look at the, um, these links across the top. And we know that those are our primary links because they correspond to the section titles that we saw in the sitemap. We see this thing on the left and we know looking through various design comps that these are changing. These items in this left hand nav are changing. So these are unique for each section. That's our secondary menu or our secondary links. Uh, across the top there's another kind of menu but it's the same throughout the site no matter where you are. So we decided that that's going to be a menu inside of a block. If we scroll down the page a bit we start to look at the content. And we see this thing at the top and then there's this thing and that thing and it looks like a whole bunch of blocks, maybe? So who here knows what we use to assemble a whole bunch of blocks? There's lots of options these days, but what's the most popular one? Panels? Anybody? Okay. So we thought this is a panel, right? This is a panel filled with blocks. That's what the section landing pages are going to be. So let's pretend we're clicking on what we do. Here's an interior page, and we look at this thing, and we don't really see anything all that special about this interior page. We see a lot of text. We see a little pullout quote here, um, but that's that's pretty much it. Nothing all that special. So we think this is just a page node. Easy. So to break this down, uh, we know that this whole thing, uh, this this top level item, the landing page, all the content below it is what they call a section, which means we call it a primary menu item within a context. They say that that is a section landing page. We know that it's a panel because we saw the wireframes in the visual design. These things below it are the section subpages. And we translate that as secondary menu items. And we know from talking to them that they're all going to be static content. So they're all page nodes. Uh, and finally, we, uh, we had to revise a lot of the site definition and a lot of the elements in the visual design because they had chosen Drupal at a stage that wasn't necessarily optimal. But sometimes that's just how life is. So we went back and did some short iterations on how we can uh, Drupalize this, uh, this design so that we can implement it faster and, and cheaper. So speaking of faster and cheaper, let's also try to make things a little bit better. Uh, I want to give everybody some practical advice on some of the things that we do in order to accelerate the, d the design and implementation phase of the process. Uh, the first is to design on a grid. Uh, if you've been to design school, this is obvious, but a lot of designers come into the web design world and have not heard of grid-based design. Uh, I want to give you an example. Now, how many Americans are in the audience? All right. Do you recognize this? No? How about now? Have you ever been to a national park? It's the Unigrid system. It was developed by uh, Massimo Vignelli, uh, an Italian designer, uh, this for the National Park Service in the United States, the idea was to create a reusable unified grid system to print out brochures on the thousands of national monuments and parks in the United States to minimize cost. So the idea is, backing up here, you could have uh, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Grand Canyon, all of these things printed in one unified design, but there's tons of flexibility here. You can make all of them look different, but they're printed on the same press, on the same paper with the same size. And you can cut them into halves and quarters and eighths and all kinds of stuff. They wanted to uh, create something that was very efficient to print. Here's another example of, uh, well, this is an example of grid-based design on the web. This is the personal homepage of Koi Vin, who designed NewYorkTimes.com. And uh, he also does a lot of work with Mark Bolton, who did, uh, who's responsible for the design for Drupal.org and the rebranding. Um, and this is an example of, this pink here represents the columns within a grid-based design. Grid-based design is going to save you time. 
it's going to save you money and it's going to reduce frustration. And what I mean is it's faster to do. Uh, it provides uh, a, a very specific restriction to work within so that you know your design is going to be of a certain width. Uh, you know that you're going to have units of measurement of certain widths. You don't have a, an, an entirely blank canvas to work in. The restraints in this case free you. Uh, so therefore it's going to save you time. And it's going to reduce frustration because if designers all use grid systems, we can pass our work among each other and better understand uh, what was done so that we don't have to go decode all of that CSS and all of that markup that was written a year ago by somebody else. And it's going to be a lot easier to revisit your own projects if you stick with some kind of a general grid design philosophy. So for just a moment, I want to meditate on, on this picture. This is one of my favorite examples of, of constraints. So here the shop owner has embraced the constraint of having a small space above the door to put a sign. And instead of putting some smaller open sign, they've done something creative. And they're still communicating open, but it makes passersby stop and think because they see those letters and they think, oh, I get it, open, that's, that's clever, that's funny. Imagine how many more people are likely to be interested in that store because that shop owner embraced that constraint. So constraints are going to narrow the scope of the design and encourage that kind of creativity. Enforcing a grid accelerates design while maintaining order. Very quickly, a good example of this is the 960 grid system, 960.gs, there's a Drupal theme. You probably recognize the 960 grid system because that is what powers Drupal.org. Uh, don't start at zero, start at Drupal. And what I mean by that is we need to increase our Drupal speak vocabulary. Earlier when I was talking about translating things into Drupal speak, if you have a larger Drupal speak vocabulary, you can translate visual designs and wireframes much faster because you have more words to describe that. And what I mean is understand, obviously, all the things in core, but there's all kinds of modules in core that nobody ever uses. So maybe they would be useful to you if you'd enable them and play with them and understand what they do. Uh, understand default blocks and menus and theme regions and variables and stuff like that. Do some research. Understand the default output and styling of Drupal. Uh, it's very easy to take a look at the default markup in CSS in Drupal 7 because of the Stark theme. It's in core. You can just enable this thing, look at the source. That's all the stuff that Drupal and contrib modules is spitting out by default. So before you have to go override anything, understand what it is that uh, it's doing by default. You can download it for six here. And again, this, these slides will be up later, so I'm going to kind of blow through the links. This is what it looks like. It's ugly. The important part is not on the left. The important part is on the right, the source code. That's what you want to look at and understand. Uh, something that a lot of people forget about is that little, little tiny modules can save you all kinds of time. So if you're running into some kind of a theming challenge, chances are other people have done it, and they've solved it, and they put it on Drupal.org, but the trick is having to find it, right? And there are thousands and thousands of modules out there. Uh, I want to give you a quick example. So back in the Drupal 6 days, and this is still sort of an issue in Drupal 7, we have this thing called CCK, which is fields in Drupal 7. Uh, by default, it outputs all of the, the stuff in their own divs, and so they just stack on top of each other. And that's not particularly all that interesting. You can do inline, but then you just have a bunch of spans. What if you want to do you know, comma-separated stuff? So if you wanted to do a comma-separated list, you'd have to overwrite, uh, overwrite a theme, the field template file, write some PHP to iterate through all of those items in the array, spit them out, do an implode uh, with a comma separation, and it gets even co more complicated if you need to do comma and, right? This, that, and the other. What if you want that kind of list? Then you have to have a counter, and then you have to insert and at the end, and it just gets complicated PHP-wise. There's got to be a better way, right? And there is. It's called the text formatter module. It's this tiny little module that you can download and enable, and it gives you all these cool options. So now instead of the default plain text trimmed, you also get commas, commas and, commas and period, unordered list, ordered list. This seems pretty easy, right? But you enable this in display fields, you change it to commas, and you're done. It's just a tiny little module, but if you didn't know to Google for text formatter or whatever, it would be very hard to find, right? And that's a challenge that we have in the Drupal community. Um, there's a page on Drupal.org, Drupal.org slash project slash modules. That's the main modules listing page. The two takeaways there are is that there's a pretty decent searching and filtering system there that you can try. Uh, apart from just using Google, which is the obvious solution, you can try using this filtering system. But it also lists the most popular modules in order. So if you go to that page, you're going to see all the popular modules. And chances are all the big ones you're going to need to use to increase your Drupal speak vocabulary will be on that page. Uh, also, Lullabot does a cool feature on their blog called Module Mondays. 
So every Monday they talk about a module and you can learn all about what it does and what it can do. Uh, it's part of their main blog. Unfortunately, there's not a link to go directly to that term or that category, but you can just read their blog every Monday. So the, the last thought we'll leave you with before we wrap up is about designing for change. And um, the main rules for designing for change are to minimize your templates. Uh, the EL site had a lot of templates that we worked with. Um, actually, there were, there were three main templates. Those had a lot of variables within them. But because we minimized that as much as we could, uh, it meant there was less maintenance uh, going forward when we had to change something or implement something new. Uh, it also is a great thing to have consistent styling. And this goes to Todd's grid system point. Uh, and also writing your CSS in an efficient way and doing visual design on elements that repeat, uh, having those things all be in sync and reference each other and building on the same systems uh, so you can quickly create extensions of layout patterns or, or individual interface elements that you've already done. Uh, it also lets people see a new thing on the site and instantly have a, an idea of how to use it because they've seen it somewhere else before or something much like it. Uh, part of that is, of course, creating a robust default template. Something that happens down the line is the client or site admin wants to create something new that you might have not have accounted for. So if you as the designer make sure you have come up with design or specified rules and guidelines for all of the elements that might happen down the road, you won't run into an issue where someone wants to create something and, oops, there's no design for it. Uh, other things that might happen is you, you want to consider accommodating content of any length. Uh, it's great when your design is robust enough to handle titles that break to two lines um, or even uh, navigation. Sorry about that. We're going to expand navigation. Um, if your navigation increases by an extra item, if you started with five but you have six, what's going to happen to your design? Uh, if you haven't been thinking about these things ahead, then uh, bad visual things happen. Uh, the Sometimes the answer is navigation can't increase. Uh, but it, the important point is that you as the designer have anticipated that that might happen and have come up with an answer for it. Um, and uh, these, all these things happen because these sites we're designing are uh, no longer pages, right? We talked about that at the very beginning. It's not just six pages uh, uh, of a site. The site is a, a very large system. Uh, of all interacting components uh, and software. This is the, the main point Todd made at the very beginning. And because everyone in this room is a designer, uh, we're really the ones responsible for that system. We're its primary architects. And all the decisions we make uh, end up impacting everything down the road. So thank you for your time. It uh, looks like we hit an hour exactly, so if anybody has any questions, um, we're going to be up here for just a couple minutes, but we're going to have to run somewhere else pretty soon. Uh, you can catch us in the hall, or if you just see us, uh, grab us, ask us questions, and um, you can follow us. Do you have a Twitter account? I don't even know. Well, look us up somehow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>